Hi friends, the Martin Center continues its coverage from the EPP Congress here in Bucharest. We're also continuing our expert interviews on a number of topics. And I'm delighted that today we're joined by Kara Massin, who is the head of uh, government affairs and public policy for the EU institutions at Google. Welcome. Thank you very much. Before jumping into the nitty gritty about artificial intelligence, technology and growth, I must ask you, elections are coming. Should we be a bit afraid or jumpy about election integrity or the risks when it comes to cybersecurity? Absolutely, it's very important. I mean, as we all know, 2024 is a big year for elections. So we actually need to do quite a lot of things. So what we've actually done is inform voters because, you know, what is important is that people go to vote. So what we did, for instance, that we're putting a lot of information on search so that you know where to vote. You can actually receive information from the manifestos, from the people. We also make sure that there is the right information which is received. So we make qualitative information coming up. Uh, we're also uh, helping the campaigners so that actually they get some training. So we're training a lot of, uh, of politicians and uh, campaign teams so that they actually know how to fight against cyber attacks, to fight uh, disinformation, but also to use new tools like generative AI to actually help them for their campaigns. Mm. And finally, we also have some, uh, some education for the people. We are running a campaign called pre-banking, which we're basically helping people understand when they receive something online, what is the source, who's trying to tell them something so that they have a bit of uh, understanding about you know, what information they get. Staying on topic of cybersecurity for just one more minute, is the threat, threat landscape getting even more evolved uh, when it comes to the actors and how difficult it is to keep up and be, you know, keep in front of the adversaries when it comes to cybersecurity and being prepared? Absolutely. I mean, I've, we've seen, you know, with the war in Ukraine, we've really seen a step up of uh, cyber attacks mm -hmm. on infrastructure but also on the people, as you say. And of course, democracy, you know, is really like a, a target for uh, bad actors to really make sure that, you know, they try to gain it. So it's always like I would say a game, you know, which we're always trying to be better in advance of them. So AI and uh, cyber is really something where we actually try to be always on top. So, you know, bad actors use AI, but then we try to actually protect with AI. And AI is a fantastic tool for that, actually. You know, it helps us to spread in terms of uh, the quantity. We can actually catch a lot of the bad actions. With cyber, we can actually see what's coming up. And then we actually be, be able to actually fight the campaigns before they come. Mm. Okay, artificial intelligence or AI as a defensive tool. But how about AI as an enabler of growth in Europe? How do you see the continent when it comes to its positioning and future possibilities when it comes to artificial intelligence? So we just adopted the AI Act, which is good because we kind of decided, okay, we need a frame, we need to make sure, you know, we tackle the risk. But now, as you're right, it's actually time to look at the opportunities. And AI is going to be a fantastic enabler for people and for the economy. There is a study that came out to say that generative AI is going to actually has the potential to develop by 1.2 trillion the economy of Europe, which is equivalent of 8% of the GDP. So this is humongous. The question is like how we roll it out. How do we actually help the SMEs? How do we help the people? How do we help the kids, you know, at school and the teachers? So how are we going to actually develop it? from the skills, but also from the capacity in terms of the innovation and then the investment to make it happen. You mentioned the AI Act when it comes to implementation. Do you think there's going to be difficulties in Europe or any challenges specifically? Well, it does go into details mm -hmm. and uh, there's going to be another like 20 to 60, uh, you know, secondary legislation guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I think, of course, the devil is going to be in the details mm -hmm. to make sure that actually it's not going to stifle innovation because AI is going very fast. So we need a regulatory frame that is good, but it's not going to be actually kind of preventing things to happen. So it's going to be about how we make that happen together and making sure that actually people can roll it out in a way that is going to be efficient and not too, cost effect, not too, too costly. You mentioned AI as an enabler of growth and the, and the opportunities, which brings to the topic about competitiveness, something which is a big buzzword here in the EPP Congress. How do you see the European Union when it comes to its positioning and when it comes to regulation as well to enable improving our competitiveness and economic growth in the next couple of years? 
where we believe technology can actually really be part of that enabler. And we believe that we don't have to make a choice between a green transition and the digital transition. We believe actually technology can help to do the, both. There is another study that came out recently who said that if we were rolling out AI and digital, we could actually save from 5 to 10 percent of GHS emission, which is equivalent of emissions of one year. So if we really you know, bring all Europe into a green transition, which is digitally empowered, that could really help actually develop. And imagine, I mean, if we can actually increase the, uh, you know, the growth of Europe by 5 to 10 percent, this would be really fantastic for Europe. And also we want uh, you know, a technology which is going to be inclusive, which is very important so that the whole society is going to go together into that transition. Staying on the topic of the twin, the twin transition, digital and, and green, how is your company tackling both of these advancements and maybe challenges? Well, we believe technology is a beautiful thing, but it's also used more and more by the people. So we want to actually make sure that our footprint is not going to be big. So we're actually one of the, uh, of the companies which is really like trying to roll on 24-7 green uh, uh, you know, emissions. And uh, what's very important for us is that we actually think about our footprint, but also we help others. So for instance, we are, I don't know if you know, but now if you do map, for mm -hmm. instance, you can actually choose you know, the most ecological yeah. route. And that has been the equivalent of saving already last year of 500,000 cars. So quite actually quite impressive. On search, you can also look for the plane, which is, you know, provide the least mm -hmm. emission that you can compensate. So we believe we need to do things for ourselves, but we also need to help the people. And we also help, of course, our supply chain to make sure we make the, the right changes. We've been talking a lot about the EU, but maybe let's bring in the, the US in this. Uh, the USA also has a very ambitious agenda when it comes to its CHIPS Act, its ambitions in semiconductors and future growth clean energy as well. Do you see potential synergies between the EU and the US when it comes to these breakthrough technologies? Or maybe we're rivals on that front? Well, absolutely. I mean, technology is global. And a lot of these discussions has to be done at the global level. Mm -hmm. There is much more competition globally. And then we believe that actually if only if the people who have the same views and the same values get together, they're going to be stronger. I mean, totally closing ourselves, I think, is not going to work. And we need partners. Europe actually needs investment. Europe needs to write to work with people. But of course, we need to work with the people that we have the same views. And I, that's why we believe that the US and the EU getting together and staying together on alignment, on standards, on you know, supply chain, you know, all these things is extremely important. And whatever is going to happen in elections on both continents, we may need to make sure that we actually stay close partners. Do you think that the Trade and Technology Council between the EU and the US is one of these important tools in the future? Or maybe the relationship is going to continue to develop bilaterally between the US and specific capitals? Or actually we can see an advancement in the EU talking to the US on a supranational level through the TTC maybe? I think the TTC is one tool. There is also the G7, which is very good. There is also the OECD. What's important that we actually have an alignment on all different processes. And yes, I mean, I think the EU-US relationship is key, but there are also other partners that I think we need to bring into, into the same direction. And whatever we do, we know either bilateral with other partners, as long as we keep that relationship strong and that dialogue strong, and then we go towards actually real advancement. So, you know, agreeing on something, you know, agreeing on how we manage AI, agreeing on standards, that's really the way forward, we believe. Closing question, you mentioned AI on an international level. The EU has its own AI Act, the US has its own specific views when it comes to regulation. Do you think there is a future for both economic blocks to set certain guardrails when it comes to prevention of proliferation of AI or biotechnology, setting the guardrails, so, so, so to speak, internationally, or this is too much of a challenge? I think that's exactly what they're doing. If you look at the uh, Hiroshima process, yeah. you know, under the G7, now they want to align it with the OECD. I think there is a discussion that maybe the OECD could take over, you know, the physical management basically of the Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima process. So I think we want that to happen. What we want is to make sure that, you know, we have the same vision of AI and that actually we have the same principle. They can be rolled out differently into the law, but that the principle stay the same because it's very important about the way we need to apply AI globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this interview with uh, Karen Massin, who is uh, Head of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google. Stay tuned for more Martin Center content and coverage.